Greetings YouTube and welcome back to another vlog. So today I'll be talking about a few things. What will we be talking about today? I don't know, but I think I will find a way and find something interesting to talk about. Like I say, these vlogs are just so unprepared, but that's the magic of them. You never know what you're going to get. So, right, um, I know a few of you enjoy my rants. I mean, I know some people don't. But, yeah, I've got a few more rants that I would like to talk about. Um, first of all, I'm sure it doesn't or not. I'm sure you're not the only people who... You're not the only people... You're not the only person, sorry. You're not the only person who feels the same way as I do about TV adverts or commercials, whatever you want to call them. What annoys me is, is how bloody long they go on for. I remember as a kid, though, adverts were like three minutes at the most. Nowadays, it's at least double that. I've seen adverts like six or seven minutes long, and it does my absolute head in. You know what? I feel as if there's more adverts than there are than there is a TV. As in, like, there's no. It feels like there's more adverts than there actually is of the show you're watching or news, whichever it is. And it's not the thing is, it's not the length that annoys me. It's the shitty adverts that they put in it as well that makes it seem more annoying than it needs to be. Stupid adverts like, oh yeah, download the app for this, for download the app for this, download the app for that. For goodness sake, we shouldn't have to rely on bloody ads for bloody uh, apps. Are you just going to encourage people to become more slaves to their phones, even though they're already slaves to begin with, like craning down, straining their thumbs, necks, you name it. I thought it's just the most pointless ones. It's others like clear score and all that lot. Oh yeah. Look at my bloody credit score and all that lot. I mean who gives a crap? I'm not bothered about your credit score. I'm not bothered about what apps are on your phone. It's like as if uh, the mobile phone has consumed your life. But it's not just uh, those sorts of adverts that annoy me as well. I don't know where I'm trying to think of other adverts as well. I don't know, the fucking meerkats, they can just, they can piss off for all I care. They've outstayed their welcome. The Goku Per Man is still there. Another man he could just piss off for all I care. Yeah, I'm sure he's a nice fella, but his adverts can just go to hell for all I care. Um, what other adverts are there that annoy me? I don't know. Had you had an accident in the last few years, you know you could be owed compensation. Well, guess what? I've not had an accident like that, so I'm all right. Well, not yet, anyway. I, I don't know. But yeah, the only accident I've had is when, let's just say, you missed time to go in the toilet. Yeah, I'm sure, we, I'm sure we've all been through there. But I've not had, like, any accident where, oh, yeah, I've had a car, I've been in a car crash and I've had whiplash or whatever. Oh, yeah, I've not. I've not been ploughed by like a a bus or something, I don't know. Oh yeah, and there are these ones, you get these uh, like these uh, funeral adverts like you have to plan for your funeral. Yeah. I it's just it's just ridiculous. I'd say adverts, it's either it's either adverts that I've done by people who've got the brick who have got less brain cells than the amount of fingers I've got on one hand. Oh, it's just depressing drivel. I just cannot stand it. But yeah, another thing that annoys me as well is uh, on Sky Sports, whenever there's supposedly a big a big game, I don't know, I'll say Manchester United are playing Arsenal, for example. They hype it up. They, have, they make it have like a trailer that... I don't know, they try and like hype up and make the trailer look as if it's for some movie. Usually they hype up the game so much, it ends up becoming a boring nil-nil draw. It absolutely gets on my nerves. I like some of the smaller teams. They have more entertaining games. I don't know. I've seen games like, I don't know, 
I'll just say Crystal Palace versus Southampton. I'm just, I'm just making something up, but games like that are more interesting than some of the big than some of the big teams. I've noticed that against even even for my team Liverpool, there's some games where we've been those games are are just hyped up, and they just watch him like you know what was it all was it all worth it. Yeah, the hyping, the hyping up stuff that doesn't need hyping up, and uh, the also, uh, but the stuff that doesn't get hyped up is the stuff that um, let's let's just say, for it gets forgotten about, and then later on would become a cult classic. Yeah, as I say, there's some classic football matches that never get talked about enough. In fact, as I say, there's some that you don't even know. It's just some of the, the main ones. I have no idea. Yeah. I also can't stand listening to the news. Not because, not just because the stories he put on there. Yeah, I know there's a lot of depressing stuff on there. But so the people or these experts that they talk to. I use the word experts very loosely because I've got to be honest with you, some of these so-called experts cannot string a simple sentence together. You have those ones who are fixated on using the word basically and literally like every two seconds. They are so fixated on using that word that when they try and make a conversation or whatever conversation comes out, the mouth is just a jumbled mess. And you're like, for goodness sake, you make zero sense. There's kids in like nursery who could speak better English than some of these people who are in their 30s and 40s. I honestly don't know what gives. And every conversation I hear starts off with, well, I think you know, you know, I think. You don't think. You're just saying what the media wants you to think. You're just talking absolute bollocks. You think you're making sense, but to the viewer, you're not. As I say, even the thickest person in the world looks like Albert Einstein in comparison. So I don't know what the hell is going on there. So I don't know what to say other than there. You're not an expert, and if you are an expert, then I don't know. It's like saying that um, it's like saying that Paul Pogba is United's best ever player. Well, he's now gone to Juventus and is injured. But yeah, it's like it's like saying that uh, it's like making someone like Scott McTominay look like Roy Keane. Which let's be honest with you, that that's just that, that's just an insult. I mean. I don't like Manchester United, but but I think you get where I'm coming from with this uh, analogy. If not, then I do apologise. I do apologise because I honestly don't know where these vlogs go. They just go in any direction. Yeah, but you have these people who are just so bloody thick. I'll say it makes... As I mentioned, it makes the thickest person look like Albert Einstein. I don't... I really, really don't get it. Yeah, I really don't. And I think that's all there is that annoys me at the moment. I mean, if there's other stuff... If there's other stuff that I can think of, it'll probably get mentioned in the next vlog. Whenever that will be. So, yeah... Um, what else shall I talk about today? Oh yeah, we'll talk about uh, which uh, video game composers I've been listening to. I mean, I, I listen to all the greats like Uma Matsu, the one who, the one who does the music for the Final Fantasy games. I mean, Final Fantasy VII, in my opinion, is the greatest video game soundtrack ever. Every song on it is great. Even the Final Fantasy games, I don't quite don't enjoy quite as much like Final Fantasy eight or ten. Still have great music. Yeah, the best video game song I've ever heard has to be "One Winged Angel." Yeah, 
Which is what you hear when you fight you know, the final fight against Sephiroth. If you know Final Fantasy VII, then, yeah. Even those who've never played Final Fantasy VII know that song really well. Yeah, but, it, but, but by the time you get to Sephiroth, when you're actually playing the game on the PlayStation 1, by that time you're overpowered so you don't get to hear the rest of the soldiers. It, it, I say it, it's a shame. But yeah. I'm not an RPG person, but I absolutely love Final Fantasy VII. I think it's the greatest RPG ever made. I mean, I do like some of the other, I do like some of the Pokemon games, but to be honest with you, the best ones were on the Game Boy and the Game Boy Advance. Though I quite enjoyed Diamond and Pearl on the the DS, but as I say nowadays, I just can't keep up with all the Pokemon. There's just there's too many now. I know there's all different like types like furry, so I don't know what the strength or weaknesses is. But I can still remember some like the, the weaknesses in like the other Pokemon games. Like I know where, uh, like I know, ice is, ice is super effective against dragon, um, ground is super effective against rock, um, and grass is super effective against water and stuff like that. I don't know how I remember some stuff like that, but. You know, I haven't played the Pokemon game in God knows how long, but yeah, as I say, I've still got, I mentioned last time that one of the first video games, about the first video game I ever bought my own money, was Pokemon Red, but I've still yeah, but I've got I've got Pokemon Blue as well, which I didn't get long not long after I got my Game Boy Color for. Yeah, for those who don't know, the Game Boy Color was the first game console I bought with my first was the first game console I bought with my own money. Yeah, so it was about seven years. I was about six or seven. No, I think it was seven years old when I got the Game Boy Color. Yeah, it was the the purple one though. Yeah, I, I remember getting. I can remember vividly uh, getting it. Yeah, so I was seven years old in 2001. But yeah, originally that was not the console I was going to get. I was saving up for another games console. Wasn't the PlayStation 2 because at that point, it, I'd say that was well. The price of that was well out of my range. In fact, I my parents were not willing to pay that. The console I was trying to save up at that time was a Dreamcast. Because I know I played on the Dreamcast with my mates. thought it was a really... I was well impressed, but yeah, I didn't quite have enough money, so I just thought, you know, I'll just buy a Game Boy Color. My brother's got one, so I'll have one of my own so we can play Pokemon together. We can do like, like, we can do like battles and uh, trading. One thing we used to do was, uh, we used to do like, we used to race each other to see who can complete the game first. Not necessarily catch all 150 Pokemon, but to see who can actually uh, beat the game normally first, who can do it the quickest and all that lot. But yeah, most of the time he he beat me. Though there, are, though there were times where I beat him quite convincingly. Yeah, because uh, I really I the more I played that the more I realised that which Pokemon was better to do the job, which ones. Had the best, like, well, no, I won't say the best attri attributes, but probably, like, the best move sets and all that lot. Which, I mean, fair enough, it does, uh, let's just say it does lack. It, it let, let's just say it makes things a bit easier. Sometimes a bit too easy, and other times you just, like, you just go for, like, the most powerful moves going. But you know, that's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, we. But uh, yeah, I was, I was getting a bit carried away about that. I was still. I was talking about video game composer. I talked about Uma Matsu. I think he's the greatest uh, game composer of all time. As is like the likes of Koji Kondo and the uh, Yuzo Koshiro. But I gotta be honest with you. As great as those ones are. I enjoy listening to some of the, the game composers that we've had here in the UK. 
some of our some of our British game composers are just absolutely fantastic. Like if you have a Commodore sixty four, or even played some of the games on the Mega Drive, that I'm sure everyone will know who Rob Hubbard is. That guy is just an absolute genius. Like when I when I did my when I did like my series of Commodore sixty four music, yeah, I know a lot. I had a lot of Hubbard stuff in it because. In my opinion, he's the greatest composer for the C64. Though I do like some of the others that were on there, like uh, Jaron Tell, and uh, who else? Who else do I like? Matt Gray, Martin Galway. Yeah, but yeah, but no, Jaron Tell is Dutch, and Martin Galway's from uh, Northern Ireland. I know, I, I I thought he was from the Republic of Ireland, but now he's from Northern Ireland. So, I know I got that mixed up, but anyway, uh, what other, but, yeah, but I mentioned, but British game composers, I mean, I like Rob Hubbard, though he's one of the best. Um, have a listen, have a listen to Dean Evans, yeah, search Dean Evans, um, type in the music for Waterworld, yeah, that's right, the, yeah, there was a video game based off the Kevin Costner movie, well, the Kevin Costner flop, yeah, of Waterworld, yeah. Yeah, the film is terrible, as is the game, but the music is absolutely fantastic. But then again, the game itself was made by Ocean, so, yeah, their games were a bit hit and miss. Sometimes they made some absolute crackers, like Robocop on the Spectrum, Daily Thompson's Decathlon. And then, yeah, they made some absolute stinkers, like, um, try and think of a really, really bad game that they made. Um, I don't know, Cobra on the Commodore 64. Uh, Tunnel B1 on the PlayStation 1, yeah, I had that game years ago. Yeah, absolute rubbish. I mean, but I think it was one of those games that had fairly decent reviews at the time. But yeah. But yeah, Ocean have had some absolutely fantastic game composers like Martin Galway. Dean Evans, as I mentioned. Uh, but the one I've been listening to a lot. And he doesn't get enough attention, in my opinion. That is uh, Jonathan Dunn. The stuff he did was absolutely fantastic. I mean, yeah, there was a few songs of his that do sound a bit samey and a bit stop-start. A bit too stop-start for my liking, but... He has done some crackers, like Robocop, as I mentioned. You know, Robocop, the music on that is great. Doesn't matter if it's the Commodore 64 version, Spectrum, Amstrad, you name it. He was really good on them. Um, he also did some really good music for the Super Nintendo for like the Jurassic Park game. I mean, the game itself is... It's, it's alright. Could be better if I had a save feature, but yeah. Some fantastic music on that. Uh, he also did the music for the Adams Family game and the, the spin off Adams Family game. Well, it wasn't a spin off, it was its own thing, but it controlled. It plays a lot like it, but it's almost Battletoads difficulty. And that game is a Pugsley Scavenger Hunt. Yeah, that, that game is absolutely sadistic, but the music on that is absolutely fantastic. Um, What else? Oh yeah, but yeah, that Adam's Family game, I've, I've got that for me Super Nintendo. And surprisingly, as difficult as it is, I actually, I've managed to complete that one a couple of times. But it does, but as I say, it takes, it's a, there's a lot of trial and error, and you have to get used to, like, the controls that are a little bit slippery, but, you know, once you get enough lives, and once you have enough lives, you can actually beat it, because I know... There's a secret room in there where uh, you can like collect like extra lives, and you're probably gonna need them. Otherwise, you're gonna get plenty of game overs. But yeah, as I say, yeah, it's one of the. It's actually a pretty good game by Ocean. Like I said, they have done a few good games, but they've also done a few stinkers. Um. Other British game composers, um, Tim Fallin, that's it, I almost forgot about him. Yeah, 
what this guy, what that guy did was just absolutely incredible. Yeah, music that sounds like prog rock. Yeah, you, but you can you can tell by listening to some of his game music, you can tell he was influenced like uh, from bands like uh, like Rush and Yes, for example. You can tell where his influences come from. Um, I honestly can't believe that some of the stuff that he did was actually from a games console. Honestly, it just sounds like proper real music. Um, yeah, some of the music he did on the, the Spectrum, Commodore 64, the NES and Super Nintendo were absolutely fantastic. Uh, unfortunately for him, he, he was one of those unlucky ones where most of the games that he composed for were absolutely god-awful. As is the case with a lot of them. That was a problem with Rob Hubbard as well. He composed music for games that were not particularly great. I mean, there was a dirty odd few like Road Rash on the Sega Mega Drive. That game is absolutely boss. Um, another game composer. Probably one of the most prolific game composers of all time. If not the most prolific. Especially here in the UK. And that is uh, David Whittaker. Um, as I say, uh, if you never heard of these guys, I'm sure some of you have, but if you haven't, just uh, just YouTube this stuff, you won't be disappointed. My favourite soundtrack of Whitaker's has to be Shadow of the Beast on the Amiga. It's one, as I say, the music on that game is absolutely fantastic. The graphics are amazing. Not so much gameplay because it has wonky as hell hit detection. Because there are many times where you punch an enemy but it just doesn't. Sometimes even when you press the punch button just before the enemy appears. Sometimes your attack won't work after they've attacked you. And you're like you know you can absolutely get stuffed. That is one of my, that is one of my peeves though in video games. Where the collision detection is so wonky that you try and hit an enemy. Yeah, they hit you first, even though you press the button just before they appear. Um, what other British game composers are there? Other British ones? Um, I'm trying to think. You know, I can't. I can't think of any more at the moment, but. Uh, but as I say, there, there's a few examples I've just mentioned. And uh, last but not, not least, one thing I've not done on this channel, and uh, and I didn't do it last year, but I thought this time round, I'm going to do my uh, predictions for the Premier League. Like I say, the, these these are just... These are just my predictions. These, this is not exactly how the league is going to finish. But as I say, if I if I'm wrong at the end of the year, then I'm wrong. Then, as I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But this is how I feel at the moment. So I'm going to start from top to bottom, like who I think will win the league, and then I'll mention the teams who I think will struggle or will get relegated. So let's get a let's. Get around to doing that. So first place. Uh, let's be honest with you. First place. There's no. As I say, there's no. There's no point in doing this, but I'll do it anyway. So first place is Manchester City. I've put City again to win the league, even though Liverpool have a good squad, and we are very strong in terms of quality and all that. I'm going to be honest with you. I think City. Have the slightly stronger team. I've got no shame in saying that. Yeah, they've signed uh, Erling Haaland from Dortmund, and uh, hopefully he can become. Hopefully he can show how great he is in the Premier League. I reckon he could be the Golden Boot winner. As I say, I could be wrong about him, but as I say, he's a very impressive player, and I hope he gets a showcase his. Uh, Skills at Man City like what he had at Dortmund. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go for Manchester City as the Premier League champions for the up and coming season. Second place, I'm going to say my team, Liverpool. 
like I say, we we've done well. We've done well signing Darwin Nunes from uh, Benfica, and uh, he's had a very impressive preseason. But hopefully, he can showcase his uh, skills off in the Premier League. And yeah, he scored in the, the Community Shield against City, which we won three one. But as I say. I'm not really bothered about the community show. It's just a fancy friendly between the team who's what who won the league and the team who won the FA Cup, which Liverpool did last season. But yeah, Liverpool, I we look a bit stronger, but so do Man City. So I'll go for them in second place. Third, I'm going to say Tottenham, and you know what? I know many people. You, I know you probably expect me to say Chelsea, but I'm actually going to go for Spurs. They've, they've done some really, really good business and uh, they, they play some passionate football under Antonio Conte. And since he's at Spurs, I think uh, Harry Kane is, uh, let's, let's just say he's he's found his form again. I know he started off a bit slow and a bit sluggish because he, re- he, he wanted to join Man City last year. But I'd say he stayed at Spurs and I reckon Spurs will will give Liverpool and Man City a tough time. But, as I say, third place for them, they're, they're looking really good. In fourth place, this is where things get a bit tricky between these two London clubs. Yeah, fourth and fifth is going to be really difficult. Yeah. But yeah, in fourth place, I've actually gone for Arsenal. I Originally, I was going to put Chelsea, but I thought, the more I thought about it, I think I'll go for Arsenal. Yeah, they've another club who have done absolutely fantastic in the transfer market. Yeah, signing Gabriel Jesus from Man City. And uh, again, he's he's done really well in the preseason. And since uh, Mikel Arteta was with Pep Guardiola at Man City under his coaching, I, I reckon some of, some of Guardiola will rub off onto Jesus. And uh, I'm looking at Arsenal to compete for the getting to the top four. But as I say, only just if they if they miss out on top four, that's probably because Chelsea have gone into it. And I'm going to put so I'll put Chelsea at the moment in fifth place, even though the even though Chelsea are, are they're as I say they've got some very good players. But the thing is, the reason why I reckon they won't finish. Above the likes of like Liverpool and Tottenham and City, is because this is because, um, as I say, uh, he could be on his way out. Uh, Timo Werner, he might be returning back to his uh, old club RB Leipzig, in Germany. So, we shall see how that goes. I mean, they've signed Kula Bali, who's a class defender from Napoli, but the thing I'm worried about Chelsea is that. Chelsea, they, they they lack they lack goals. That's the thing. They they score goals, but I honestly don't think they score enough goals. And uh, I don't know. And the strikers aren't necessarily prolific or anything like that. I say they're decent, but they could be better. And uh, sixth place, I'm gonna go for Manchester United. Yeah, where they finished last season. But yeah, the reason why I'm putting them into sixth is even though they've got Eric Ten Hag, he's hoping to battle football at Old Trafford. But as I say, the, the squad is still a bit of a shambles, if I'm being honest with you. There are some good players, but as I say, there's a lot of negativity in the dressing room. And you don't know what's happening with Cristiano Ronaldo. We don't know whether he's going to leave United or not. They're still, they're still wasting the time trying to sign Frankie de Jong, even though I don't reckon he'll be leaving Barcelona. Yeah, they're wasting time. Even though he signs some players from the Dutch league. Sorry, got any, sorry about that. Got an itchy nose. Yeah, they've signed some decent players, but I don't know. There's still a lot of uh, animosity, and it needs addressing fast. Hopefully, hopefully Ten Hag can improve things, and you never know. United could finish higher up in the table, but at the moment, 
I'm not convinced. And it's going to take a long time for them to get back to where they once were. So, that's all I can say about that. Um, seventh place, I have gone for West Ham. Again, uh, West Ham finished seventh last season. And I reckon they'll finish seventh again. Because uh, they're, they're a squad who have improved quite a bit over the years. As I say, they could finish higher, they could finish lower, but 7th place to me sounds alright. David Moyes knows what he's doing. And it does as I say, they've played some really they played some really positive football. I reckon last season they could they could have finished higher than seventh. In fact, very nearly finishing in the top four. But because they had to play European football, it has it has affected them slightly, it has affected them a bit. But you know, I'm going to go for 7th, I reckon 7th place again for West Ham. So, you never know. 8th place, I've actually, I've gone for Newcastle United. I've gone for Newcastle in 8th. And uh, Eddie Howe has transformed our team around. Well, last season, he just, he, he did the impossible and saved Newcastle from inevitable relegation. I don't know how he did it because... Uh, the way Newcastle were last year, they looked absolutely doomed. But, as I said, they've now been invested by uh, some billionaires. And now Chelsea are going to become one of the richest clubs. Uh, Chelsea, sorry. Newcastle. Sorry, just get mixed up between another rich club. But yeah, Newcastle. As I said, they've become one of them. And I honestly haven't got a problem with that. Yeah, Newcastle... When I was a kid, they were one of the best teams in the Premier League. I remember when they were challenging for the title back in the, the early 2000s, like 2002. 2003, playing in the Champions League. But yeah, but they are looking they are looking strong. Or a lot stronger compared to last season. And they're looking a lot more... Uh, I say they, they look a lot more positive. They could actually finish higher than that, but... I don't know, I've gone for 8-8 eight, eight for Newcastle. I just like the style of football they've played under Eddie Howe. Even though many people were sceptical like myself. But yeah, ninth place, I've gone for Aston Villa. Yeah, I know Aston Villa... Uh, I'd say Aston Villa dropped off the pedal a little bit towards the end of the last... Uh, towards the end of the last season, but... I reckon the players will have adapted to Steven Gerrard's uh, style of play. And uh, like I say, uh, they don't, Villa don't have to do much. They just have to, as I say, just keep uh, a good momentum going. And I reckon they'll do a lot better this season than they did last season. So uh, that's all I can really say about uh, Leicester, uh, not Leicester, sorry, Aston Villa. Because in 10th place... Uh, in 10th place, I've gone for Leicester City. Um, yeah, they've lost Kasper Schmeichel and some of their players could be on the way out. But, you know, I reckon that Leicester will just about just about finish in the top half. I mean, if they sell more players, he could finish quite a bit lower. But, as I say, at the moment, he's still got James Madison and Jamie Vardy as a few other players. And Thielmans... As it stands, but it could things could all change, and uh, yeah, we shall see from there on. Eleven for put Brighton and Hove Albion. Yeah, Brighton last season had a really were really really good. Yeah, they managed to finish ninth, which no one was expecting that. If I'm being honest with you. Yeah, they've had some very impressive wins against Manchester United when they hammered them 4-0. Who would have guessed? Yeah, I reckon they'll finish a bit lower because uh, they've sold their Cucurella to Chelsea. Who was? Yeah, Man City were offering them to... I mean, they were getting offers from Man City, but... But they, they wanted more from him, so he's gone to Chelsea for £50 million. Like I say, Brighton will just about miss out on the top 10. But as I say, I still wouldn't... Um, I, I still wouldn't... Um, how can I put it? I still wouldn't write them off, because you never know. Um, 
12th place I put Wolves. So, uh, I don't I don't know. I mean, Wolves, are, I don't know. The one those teams, even though they've got good players, the problem that I have with them is that I honestly don't feel as if they score enough goals. Hopefully, if they score more goals, then you never know. They could finish higher. But at the moment, I'm going to say 12th place for Wolves. Uh, they've not really done much in the transfer market from what I can see. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, so, yeah. 13th place, I've gone for Crystal Crystal Palace. Yeah. I like the style of football that they play under Patrick Vieira. But, I don't know. Even though... Uh, but the problem that I have is with Palace is that they rely too much on Wilfred Zaha. And, yeah, he's, he's easily, the, easily the best player. And sometimes I feel as if he carries... The whole team on his back more often than he should. As I say, there are there are some decent players, but if they pulled away a bit more and keep doing and keep improvement, you never know. They could they could finish in the top half. They could, but I'm not too sure. Uh, Fourteenth have gone for Brentford. Uh, yeah, Ericsson uh, was one of the reasons why yeah, they stayed up as well. Thomas Frank. Did wonders. I actually predicted them last season to stay up as the underdogs, and they did. Many people wrote them off, but I wasn't willing to do that because uh, the, the style of play under Thomas Frank was just absolutely fantastic. But I thought, you know what? I, I said I said to a few of my mates, I thought, what well, we're keeping out for Brentford, they're going to do something, they're going to stay in the league, and they have. Um, in 15th place... Now this is this one's going to be a surprise. I'm actually going to go for a newly promoted team, and the team that I'm going for, a team who has not played in the Premier League for a very very long time, is Nottingham Forest. And the reason why I'm going to go for Forest is they've done some absolutely terrific uh, business in the transfers. But yeah, the. But teams who get promoted from the Premier League, they get these uh, parachute payments where they get given a shitload of money to sign players. But, yeah, I reckon Nottingham Forest can do stuff. And they do really... Because they haven't been in the league for 23 years. They want to try and prove a point. And I reckon they will. I mean, if they go down, it won't be in the... As I say... It won't... I say... At least it... At least he tried in uh, in vain, if if I'm right in saying that. But, yeah, they signed Jesse Lingard from Manchester United. Yeah, he barely got played. Dean Evans, uh, Dean Evans, I'll talk about that game composer before, sorry. Dean Henderson, I apologise. Dean Henderson, uh, he's happy to join Nottingham for us because Manchester United left him on the bench. Yeah, because he was promised that he would be the number one keeper. And he didn't get played, and he was just, he was absolutely fuming. I know he had like a scathing interview, and he he, he mentioned uh, that he was not happy. But yeah, he, he wanted, he'll want to get as much game time as possible for Nottingham Forest. So I, I reckon Forest will stay up, and uh, they will give it a good fight. 16th, I've gone for Everton. Yeah, no, yeah, Everton last season were absolutely dreadful. In fact, it's probably the worst Everton team I think I've ever seen. Though, to be fair, the Everton team in 2004 nearly got relegated. But, yeah, they stayed up because of other results. Yeah, and I, I don't reckon... I reckon Lampard will be the first manager to get sacked. Yeah, they sold Richarlison to uh, Tottenham. And even though they have signed a few players like Dwight McNeil, for example, but I don't know, Everton are going to have a very, another very, very difficult season. I won't be surprised if they do go down, but for the time being, I've put them to finish 16th, where they finished last season. Uh, 17th, I've put Southampton. Yeah, Southampton are one of those teams. They're one of those teams that either do rather well or just absolutely abysmal. Last year they will they finished fifteenth. 
It's a shame because they, they started off the season really well. And I don't know. I don't know what the hell's happened to Southampton. But all I can say is I reckon they're gonna they're gonna struggle. They are gonna struggle. But they will stay up by the skin of their teeth. Because as I say, I'm not very certain about how the team is at the moment. So that's it. Um, 18th place. I'm going to put a team who just about stayed up last season. But I reckon the time in the Premier League is up. And that is Leeds United. Yeah, Leeds. Uh, I don't know. Even though they do play some good, some decent football under uh, Jesse Marsh. The... Unfortunately, the, they do play some fo- some decent football, but the problem is, is uh, they concede far too many goals, sometimes unfairly. There are times where they do deserve it, though. Yeah, Leeds are one of those teams that they concede far too many goals for their own good. Like I said, there are some decent players, but they could do with a good kick up the backside if they have any chance of staying up. Yeah, that's it. I'm worried about Leeds. Uh, 19th have gone for Fulham. Yeah, they're a team who are just they're too good for the championship. Yeah, when you get promoted to the Premier League, they're absolute shite. I'll be honest with you. The only player who's keeping them afloat is Mitrovic. But I reckon the reliance on him and some of the other players not pulling the weight could result in them going down again. Because they're one of those yo-yo teams. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. How about just not get fucking promoted? i got to be honest with you. I can't stand Fulham. Yeah, I, I cannot stand Fulham. Duh, I said it. I've, I mean, Fulham never used to bother me. But I don't know, recent times, they're just one of those teams that just get on me tits. I don't know why they just do. I've, I've had enough of Fulham. I know it. I know I'm being, I can't help but criticise them, but yeah, from what I've seen, Fulham have absolutely fantastic supporters, but I don't know how they cope with this. I don't know how they can accept going up then going down. Yeah, how about how about you just stay in the Championship or just stay in the Premier League? Make your bloody mind up, and then the team we're going to go for bottom is Bournemouth. I'm very sorry. I do like Bournemouth. Scott Parker did an absolutely amazing job getting them back into the Premier League with the players that they've got. But I'm going to be honest with you, just like Fulham, I honestly don't feel as if their squad is strong enough to stay stay up. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I don't know. I'm not very convinced at the moment. If they do stay up, I'll give them credit. And I will applaud them. So, we'll, we shall leave it there with the, uh, the Premier League predictions. So, I'm hoping, uh, as I say, I'm hoping, uh, I don't know. I'm hoping I'm proven wrong with some of my results. But, as I say, there are some teams that I honestly don't know where to put or I have no confidence in. So, uh, so uh, the predictions that I put... I put Man City to win the league, Liverpool to finish second, Tottenham third, Arsenal fourth, Chelsea fifth, Man United sixth, West Ham seventh, Newcastle eighth, ninth Aston Villa, tenth Leicester, eleventh Brighton, twelfth Wolves, thirteenth Crystal Palace, fourteenth Brentford, fifteenth Nottingham Forest, sixteenth Everton, seventeenth Southampton. 18 Leeds, 19th Fulham, and Rock Bottom in 20th Bournemouth. So that's what I think will happen. So anyway, I think I shall call this uh, vlog, I shall call it a day, because I'm starting, my mouth's starting to get a bit dry, my throat's getting a bit sore from all this talking. So anyway, I shall see you next time. I hope you have a safe day.